test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 When Mark and Jane arrived in Edinburgh, they discovered that Mark had left his camera on the train. At the lost and found office, he has to fill in a lost property form. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good evening, sir. Can I help you? Yeah, I think I left my camera on the train from London early today. Did you, sir? Oh, well. In that case, we'd better fill in a lost property form. Can you tell me your name? Yeah, it's Mark Adams. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, your address? You mean in Britain or in the States? Uh, how long are you staying? Oh, I've still got a few months in Britain. Okay, then, can you give me your address here? Right. It's 21, uh, Thames Drive, uh, Lee on C. That's L-E-I-G-H uh, on C, Essex. Uh -huh. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Do you want the phone number? Uh, yes, I'd better have that. OK, uh, 0702 35211. Thanks. And you say it was a camera. What make and model? It's a Rico. Rico. How do you spell that? R-I-C-O-H. OK, got that. Now, you say it was the London train. What time did it arrive in Edinburgh? At 4.55 this afternoon. Exactly on time. Uh, well, then, if we find it, sir, shall we phone you? No, I think I'll drop in the day after tomorrow to check up. Ah, uh, right you are, sir. We'll do our best. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. She's going to talk to us today about the pleasures of running her own business. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Good morning and welcome to this month's Small Business Club meeting. I'm very pleased to welcome Amy Lynn, who owns and runs a catering business in the local area. She's going to talk to us today about the pleasures of running her own business. Amy. Thank you very much. 
Now, I started my business two years ago selling very high quality ready made meals using all organic ingredients sourced from the local area. And I have to say, it has been the happiest time of my life with sales doing extremely well. I've had to work very hard, and this has meant a rather limited social life. <laughs> But I really value the fact that I'm my own boss, and I can decide what I do, you know, when I think I'm ready to try something new and creative, and when to continue with what I'm doing, and so forth. Now, I got the idea to produce these dishes when I was visiting a local supermarket. And I looked at what was on offer in the ready meals section. Lots of low quality, unhealthy packs. And I thought, I could do so much better. I discussed it with friends. Some of them thought it was a great idea, and others thought there wouldn't be a big enough market for such expensive products. But I went ahead with my idea anyway. And as I say, it's been very successful. At the moment, I employ two people one to help me with the actual preparation and cooking, and the other to work on the financial side, doing invoices and accounts and marketing. My business is expanding, but I'm not ready to employ anybody new just yet. At the moment, I'm negotiating with a local organic farmer who would like to sell my meals at his farm shop. We've already agreed that I will sell in his shop in the new year, but I just don't know how much. It probably won't be enormous. My sales in total at the moment are only about £7,000 a month, and at least for the next few months, I don't plan on increasing that. I think the thing which will make me take on new staff is if I just feel too exhausted and stop enjoying what I'm doing. And plans for the long term future are a little vague at the moment. I've been thinking that in a couple of years' time, I'll start to sell on the internet. My sales will increase quite a bit.、Um, I won't advertise because that might mean I would expand so fast that I couldn't continue to use all organic ingredients. And I'm very anxious to go on doing that. But I think I'll need a bigger kitchen and packing area, otherwise, we'll get very cramped. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Now, I've emphasized how much pleasure I get out of running my own business, but of course, one of the quickest ways to lose heart is to try operating without sufficient capital. So, in the second part of my talk, I want to share with you how I got enough money to finance my business. The most significant part of my capital came from a grant from the Small Business Agency, or SBA as everyone calls it. And this is how you go about getting it. The first thing you have to do is to draw up a business plan. Now, don't make this too long and complicated. I would say it should just be up to two pages in length. I've seen some people's efforts go up to 10 pages. Well, frankly, I don't think anyone will read it if it's that long. The next thing is it's worthwhile getting it checked. Now, don't rely on an accountant for this. Your best bet is to go to your bank and get them to look through it. Only if they're happy should you go ahead with your application. If all is well, then you should finalize your submission. Then your next step is to send it to the SBA. Now, they advise you not to do this by email, but by post. However, they say this situation might change in the near future. 
So, when the SBA receive your grant application, they'll judge whether your business idea is interesting, that is, likely to benefit from their grant. If they think it's good, they'll invite you to interview. And then the successful candidates can get a maximum of £20,000. I got £18,000, which wasn't quite the top amount, but still enormously useful, as you can imagine. Now, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two students who will discuss a project they're working on together. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 27. Hey Jess, glad you could make it. We've got a lot to discuss. Hi Matt. Yes, sorry I'm a bit late. I did bring all my notes with me. Yes, me too. Where shall we start? Well, I think it would be a good idea to clarify our objectives just one more time. Yes, good idea. Okay, here we are. We need to record, photograph and identify the plant species in 10 one square meter plots. Does it say anything about where these plots should be and how they should be laid out? Ah, here it is. It says that all the plots need to be no more than 10 metres apart. And how do we choose them? Ah, this is the fun part. I remember this. Here we are. Make a one metre square frame using bamboo sticks available from the department stores. Yes, we've, we've already done that. I know, I'm just reading the whole section. OK. One person stands roughly in the middle of the chosen area and throws the frame. The other person uses a tape to mark out the square where the frame landed and returns frame to thrower. The thrower then turns a few degrees on the spot and throws again. The thrower must turn slightly after each throw and vary the force of the throw until after the tenth throw they are pointing in almost the same direction as the first. That sounds a bit complicated. That's only because it's all in writing. It's just a simple throw, turn, throw, turn, throw, turn, until we have ten squares. And I guess you want to do the throwing. Well, if you don't mind. I'm sure you'll be more accurate at marking the squares. Yes, I am sure I am, and I'm sure you've got a stronger throwing arm. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 28 to 30. OK, good. We've got that sorted. Now we need to decide where to go. Yes, I've been thinking about that and I've brought the map. Ah, well done. I forgot mine. Now, I've identified three possible locations, but they've all got some disadvantages. OK, fire away. Well, the area around this lowland marsh could be interesting. There'll be a lot of interesting water plants here. Looks good, but what's the problem? 
mainly that it's already a designated nature reserve, and I think there's already been a lot of research done here. Ah, I see. Well, I'd rather do something that's new and can be useful. I agree. That's why I identified this area further west. See here, behind the beach. Oh yes, I see that area there, where it's flat but quite high. Exactly. If you look a bit further inland, you'll see that there are hills which will protect that area from strong north winds. I see. Excellent. But what's the problem? Just that it may not be very interesting. We know that the geology there is not conducive to a wide variety of plants. Hmm. I agree. So, what's your last idea? Well, I think this one is a bit of a winner. Although I did want to show you the other two. Look up here on the north coast. Where? See this bay? Well, I know that there's been quite a lot of studies done here, but a bit further to the east, behind this headland. No one has ever looked at that. Well, I certainly couldn't see any studies. That is interesting, and the plant life could be a bit different because of the shelter from the wind the headland provides. Exactly. Brilliant, Jessica. That's a great idea. We'll go there. Thanks. Now all we have to decide is when is a good time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator, giving advice on how to get your first job or commission as an artist. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Now listen carefully, and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-five. I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator who has come along today to talk to you all about getting your first job or commission as an artist. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me. I remember when I graduated back in 1983. I was very excited about getting my first commission. My degree was in fine art, and I'd worked long and hard to get it. I was an enthusiastic student, and I never found it difficult to find the incentive to paint. I think as a student, you're pushed along by fellow students and tutors, and the driving force is there. However. When you leave college, you find yourself saying things like, "I'll have one more cup of coffee and then I'll sit down to work." <laughs> I, I hate to admit it, but I say it myself. Suddenly, it isn't finding the inspiration or getting the right paper that's a problem; it's you. In my view, there are a number of reasons why this happens. It's a real challenge making a decent living as a new artist. You have to find a market for your work. Often, you work freelance and need to take samples or portfolios of your work from place to place. These experiences are common to a lot of professional people, but artists also have to bare their souls to the world in a way. More than anything, they want praise. If people don't like what they create, then it can be a very emotional and upsetting experience hearing them say this. 
I began to realise that these problems were preventing me from having a career in art, and so I decided to experiment. I was a painter, but I started to dabble in illustration, drawing pictures for books, cards, and this offered me the opportunity to become more emotionally detached from my work. I was no longer producing images from the heart, but developing images for a specified subject, taking a more practical approach. I began to develop a collection of my illustrations, which I put into a portfolio and started to carry around with me to show prospective clients and employers. But it was still tricky because publishers, for example, want to know that your drawings will reproduce well in a book, but without having had any work published. It's hard to prove this. Having a wonderful portfolio or a collection of original artwork is, of course, a first step. But what most potential clients would like to see is printed artwork, and without this evidence, they tend to hold back still when it comes to offering a contract. Look at questions thirty-six to forty. Now answer questions thirty-six to forty. Well, I overcame this problem in two ways, <clears throat> and I, I suppose this is my advice to you on preparing your portfolio of your best work. The first way was by submitting my work for a competition, and the one I chose was for a horoscope design and was sponsored by a top women's magazine. There are a few of these competitions each year, and they offer new illustrators an opportunity to showcase their work. The other approach I took was to design and print some mock-up pages of a book. In other words, I placed some of my illustrations next to some text in order to demonstrate how my work would look when it was printed. <laughs> Perhaps I was lucky in that I, I had taken a degree that provided me with all-round creative skills, so that I could vary my style and wasn't limited to a certain technique. Now I think that is important. The art world and many other creative fields do try to pigeonhole people into snug boxes with an accompanying label. Now I think you should try to resist this if you feel it happening to you. If you don't. You'll find it difficult to have new work accepted if you try to develop your style at a later stage in your career. Nevertheless, when you start out, and particularly when you're going for an interview, it's important not to confuse people by having a lot of different examples in your portfolio. One remedy for this is to separate your work into distinct categories. In my case. I did this by dividing my design-inspired illustrations from my paintings. It's then easier to analyse the market suited to each portfolio, such as magazines, book jackets, CD covers, etc. Working under two names is also useful, as it clarifies the different approaches and offers a distinction between them. I think it's been hard for artists to be recognised in anything other than the pigeonholes that they've been placed in. But luckily, these barriers are slowly being demolished. So I really do wish you all success. That is the end of part four. You now have.